Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for coming to the webcast. Uh, I'm excited to talk about, I think, a really important topic, which is one of our biggest security blind spots, which is all about DNS and the ability to get back and regain visibility within DNS in order to protect our infrastructure moving forward. So really, you know, I think Bill Gates had a great quote here, which was really that the 80s were really all about kind of engineering quality in the 90s, um, really about re-engineering and kind of redefining and rebuilding things. And the 20th and the 21st century really are about velocity and, and pace. And it's not um, really about um, the quality of the service that is being delivered in, in that kind of point in time. It's all about kind of adapting and changing your technology and your business that surrounds that. And information security is particularly interesting because there's really two factors of change. You've got the one that everyone thinks about, which is really the threat landscape, which is, you know, how are the attackers evolving? What's happening um, in our attack surface? Um, what are we doing about that attack surface? And then we also have the technology landscape. You know, really, how are we computing? How are individuals connecting to the internet? How are our servers connecting? How do we deliver those services? And those are equally as important uh, to track. And really the three kind of main areas of technology chain that uh, changed that I'm sure most of you are familiar with are really mobility, um, you know, the, the, the use of big data, and this massive amount of information that's happening, and of course the cloud. And these really are kind of the, the three pillars of change that we deal with every single day, and particularly in the way that uh, users are computing and the way that we are consuming um, information. And the way I think about those is really that, you know, mobility is about always on. It's about connecting on any device at anywhere from any time. Um, you know, work, of course, is, is not a place anymore. It's something you do. Um, you don't really hear things uh, or hear, hear, hear really employees say stuff like, hey, I'm going to get around to that when I get, you know, in front of my computer at work. Um, it's just about getting the job done and getting it done in, in its, as frictionless way as possible. Secondly is this massive kind of industry or set of industries that have been built based off of this information and the information economy. And the appetite for data is at an all time high. So the ability to consume the data, the ability to use the data to, to provide meaningful um, results is becoming really key in technology. And lastly, there's this disappearing perimeter and the cloud and the ability to consume services um, without having to deploy software or hardware is allowing us to actually, of course, work and to, uh, to um, use these consumer services moving forward without the need for software, for hardware, or for actually having to be physically sitting in kind of the castle of work. I think Gartner has a, has a pretty good stat here that, you know, in 2018, which is really, a, you know, a little more than three years away, almost 25% of all corporate traffic will essentially subvert the traditional perimeter firewalls and next generation this and kind of threat prevention that, that is really predicated on seeing the traffic. Um, I think that number is actually a, a little bit low, um, you know, especially as 3G and 4G comes out and, you know, pervasive and ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitous Wi-Fi um, allows people to connect anywhere at any time. And at the same time, you know, the threat landscape is changing at a very rapid rate. Um, there's, there's a number of changes around the adversaries and their motives. You know, of course, you hear mostly about kind of the criminal aspect of, of what's happening. But, of course, government hacking is, is uh, becoming more and more popular. Um, targeted and corporate espionage, geopolitical and hacktivism are all things um, that we need to be aware of. And at the same time, the tools and techniques are becoming more sophisticated. And the reason I've kind of been these together is because it's not uncommon for different groups to share, um, cooperate, um, and, and or buy, borrow, or steal kind of tools and techniques and mix those two together. So you may see, you know, an hacktivism technique that maybe uses a zero day and, you know, um, you know a criminal may use that same zero day. And also maybe um, someone may use that for espionage. They may even use the same infrastructure in some, in some uh, instances. Um, they may also hijack the data in a similar way. The net effect is that it's becoming harder and harder to gain visibility and to protect our enterprise and our constituents moving forward. And the defenders, um, you know, aren't keeping up. You know, security is, of course, uh, you know, really predicated on first and foremost being able to see the traffic. 
and having visibility into what's going on on um, you know on your networks and on your laptops inside and outside the perimeter. And of course, it's becoming very hard for technologies like signature, behavior-based, um, and other types of technologies that are predicated based off of a copy of something, maybe a copy of a sample, a copy of an email, or a copy of a website. But the whole idea of gathering something and then reacting to that is an old way to think about it. And we really turned that, uh, that on its head. We're providing visibility through our, our massive network at scale, which we're going to talk about in a bit. And we've built this predictive system, which allows us to find and discover these things before patient zero or the first victim is infected. So as I said, visibility is kind of the key cornerstone to security. You know, quite simply, if you can't see something, you can't stop it, you can't detect it, or you can't know what exactly happened, um, you know, in an attack in some way. And if we think about DNS, you know, just a quick overview around, you know, the, the two key aspects of DNS. Um, the first, first one really is authoritative DNS. The easiest way to think about this, this is kind of the set of systems that's answering the requests from clients that are going to your domain. So you may have a website, you know, www.website.com. The, the end users out on the internet would be going to your infrastructure to determine what the authoritative name server is for that. And you would say, hey, the name server for my domain is this IP address, and you would answer that. They would get to your infrastructure. Recursive DNS is all about the way that your users get to those locations. So these are the systems that are making the requests on behalf of the clients. So let's say a client wants to get to some website out on, you know, out on the Internet. They would go to your recursive DNS service. The recursive DNS service, would, their job is to find out what that name to IP address mapping is so the client is getting to the right location at the right time. So that may be a laptop, that may be a phone, that could be a desktop, of course, or it could be a server. And DNS is really kind of one of the key fabrics of the internet. I mean, without DNS, we'd be typing in all these IP addresses in our browsers. And we have to, you know, instead of sending a mail to, you know, someone at Gmail, you'd be sending a mail to, you know, someone at an IP. Um, you know, or an IPv6 number. And obviously that's not going to work. Um, you know, no one's going to remember that. Um, however, we really kind of forgot about DNS as a way to manage or to look at the data or to use it as a security uh, piece. And there's been some great um, kind of news articles and, and papers about this. And um, sometimes it's been called the DNS blind spot. You know, Dark Reading had a good paper on it um, and, and a good article. And the stats um, that we show here is that 97% of all advanced malware uses DNS as part of the attack. And that's because it provides the great resiliency of being able to move your servers around, being able to change your servers, and not having those servers be taken down. At the same time, um, we were wondering how many people out there are actually looking at DNS as a way to secure their infrastructure, as a way to secure their users, and potentially as a way just to log what exactly is going on. So we, we ran a survey, um, we had uh, literally thousands of responses, and the number that came back was that 75% of all survey users do not monitor and apply security for DNS. So this is where this huge blind spot comes in. There's this great protocol that is super valuable, that is really a low layer of how we ramp onto the internet, and 75% of everybody is not even looking at it as a way to apply security. So looking at kind of the, the, the problems in the attacker side, I'm going to talk a little bit about the authoritative side, uh, more for educational purposes. And then, of course, I'm going to deal, dig into some more details on recursive because that's really um, you know, open DNS's bread and butter. So in the authoritative side, you know, one of the most common attacks now on authoritative DNS servers, and this is your infrastructure, is denial of services. And this is a map of a denial of service against um, the Hong Kong um, uh, website that was hosting some of the elections during the Hong Kong election. And you can see this was 2 million plus requests per second. This is a massive, widely distributed denial of service attack that is actually connecting to their website and ultimately took the website down. And of course, people couldn't log in and look at election results and, and um, you know, apply to vote for that. The second was the Syrian Electronic Army. 
So the Syrian Electronic Army is a kind of an alleged um, nation state sponsored um, group. And they go after um, places on the internet where they can gather intel and uh, potentially um, send information out based off of that intel. So they go after a lot of people like the New York Times. In this particular case, Twitter and Huffington Post also was attacked. And we have the ability to visualize our data because we have such a massive amount of data. We, some, we build these visualizations which allow you to really get a, a, a detailed picture of what actually is going on. Um, and it demonstrates how, how uh, critical DNS and the ability to look at the data in a meaningful way to protect yourselves moving forward is. So this is actually an animation of our um, Open Graffiti um, visualization engine. And as you can see, New York Times, Huffington Post, and Twitter were all connected when the attack happened. So the attacker essentially took over the name records and pointed them to the Syrian Electronic Army, which is this 141.105 IP address which in turn was connected to a bad location on the internet. And everybody in the world that was going to those properties, regardless of where you were, what device you were on, was not going to the real domains or the real websites or sending mail to the right people. They were actually going to the Syrian Electronic Army. So of course, a critical piece of infrastructure that really needed a better uh, protection. So recursive DNS. And recursive DNS is a critical way that the attackers are actually attacking the end users and their devices and their data um, that are behind DNS. And there's a number of different ways that they do this. One is they may have a bot or they may have an exploit which simply connects to one single domain. And that's kind of what we call kind of a static setup. And they can change that static IP address in real time, but it's not really that effective because all it takes is for the good guys to take down one domain and then that's the end of the attack. So then what happened is the attacker started doing this thing called flexing or fast flexing, where they have multiple name servers and they distribute those name servers around the internet and they have a very low time to live on the domain records for those. So this allows them to bounce their IP addresses and bounce their domains all over the place in real time. So if one gets taken down, they simply move it to somewhere else. If that one gets taken down, they simply move it somewhere else. And this allows the attacker to maintain that connectivity and that back channel to the infected host, which essentially provides them resiliency in their attack. And then the last one is domain generated algorithms. So these are algorithm, algorithmic um, processes that the attackers use to pre-compute domain names that they know aren't registered by anybody else. And then based off of the algorithm, it could be based off of a dictionary, it could be based off of an engram of some sort, could be based off of a combination of time, date, and a dictionary. They create these domains in real time, and the bot knows that, hey, on this time at this date, maybe this second, I'm gonna to connect to a new domain, and then a new domain, and a new domain. And this provides them yet another level of infrastructure and resiliency, so if the, the kind of head of the bot or the command and control gets disconnected, they can move that around. So at OpenDNS, you know, really we kind of wake up every single morning and really our main goal here is to predict and prevent these attacks before they happen. And we do this through a variety of ways, but DNS is obviously a core component of that. And by and large, we do it through this massive cloud infrastructure that we've built up over the years. We've got 24 data centers around the world. We have more than 10,000 businesses that use our service today. We, we put security and performance at equal um, points. So we have zero latency in the connectivity, and we service literally more than 2% of the entire internet's DNS traffic, which is a small number, but it's representative of a very large number. It's literally today 60 billion requests every single day and more than 50 million users that are actively using the service. And we have a very, very great track record around our uptime and resiliency. And we've been doing this since 2006. Um, and the network has been built and has been getting better over time. Um, it's not like, you know, we were a client software or software company and we added cloud capabilities or bought a company. We were infrastructure from the beginning. So in 2009, we really started doing enterprise and, and we started doing um, predominantly third-party feeds. We pushed them out. And then in 2012, we started realizing that one of our key pieces or assets that we have is this massive amount of data. So that's when we really started applying science to our data and started building these predictive algorithms. 
we started adding more things to our infrastructure like proxy and VPN capabilities. And today, as I said, we've got more than 10,000 customers in the enterprise that are protecting their customers and DNS is a key aspect to that protection. And so let's look at uh, you know, some, some really interesting attacks that have happened over the last 12 months or so. And again, we're gonna visualize these attack and see how attacks and see how DNS is really key to that. Um, so the first one is CryptoLocker. Um, CryptoLocker is, of course, this piece of malware that connects onto your machine, encrypts your data, and then holds your user's ransom, or potentially your company ransom, in order to get the um, in order to get money from you to get their data back or to get your data back. And so when I play this animation, you'll see this is actually um, what's called the co-occurrences of all the domains. So CryptoLocker uses a domain-generated algorithm. And basically what we're doing here is we're mapping and tracking the likelihood of what is the next domain, the next domain, the next domain that all the users are connecting to or the clients are connecting to on the internet. So if we know one user is connecting to a bad domain, we look at all the other users on the internet that are connecting to that same place, and then we see which domains they have in similar that connect in sequence. And that kind of worm that you see in the middle there are all the co-occurrences of the crypto locker domains. So by looking at the, and building an algorithm to look at the sequence of these domains, we can protect the end users from the encryption um, from being successful. So this allows us to stop that private key handshake. And the end result is that your end users do not have their data encrypted. The next one is Kelios, which is um, you know, a, a fairly um, infamous uh, botnet. Um, this is the, uh, an animation, um, uh, again, by Open Graffiti, which looks at the domains the, and the IP addresses and the associated autonomous system numbers that are connecting to um, Kelios. And so you see what is really interesting here is essentially by looking at the data graphically, it's very simple. When you look at it graphically, you say, Immediately, you're like, wow, what's going on here? There's a lot of connected things that are going to two or three of these big things. And essentially, what this shows is that there's this proxy network of, of botnet command and control, which are proxying the traffic from the IP addresses, which are, in a sense, going to a small number of proxy or motherships with the command and control. So, by classifying not just the, um, the proxy botnet command and control, but understanding where ultimately they go. We can protect our users from and identify our customers that they have infected clients that are connecting here. The last one I'm going to look at is Zeus um, or Game Over. Um, Game Over is a, a very interesting piece of malware. Um, DNS is a, is a critical piece of that. And what we um, can also do with our visualization is look at an attack over time. So on the bottom left-hand side, you'll see the time that we were tracking this. Um, so you can see this is over, I think it started on May 3rd. And every about six hours or so, they're adding new IPs to the domains, and they're adding new domains in real time. And we have the ability to track the changes of these and protect people from connecting to those changes. So this gives you a real appreciation for how big their infrastructure is. So you can see here, we're talking about thousands of servers out there that are hosting this stuff, and thousands of domains that are being created and changed and modified in a small amount of time. So, you know, right now we're looking at four days of activity, and this is just four days of their infrastructure. This is not IPs connecting to them. This is not affected clients. This is, this is all of the uh, infrastructure that they've built up over time that they are changing and modifying in order to maintain their connections back to their clients and to, and be, to be resilient so nobody can take them down. So, as I said, visibility is critical. Um, and we really believe DNS is really paramount to regaining that visibility. On the authoritative side, you really need to get a strategy around your DNS records. You know, who is somebody hosting it? Do you host it, you know, internally? It's amazing how many people we talk to and we ask, you know, hey, who runs their authoritative DNS and they don't necessarily know. Um, there's a way to actually lock your records. Um, so you can lock your records, which means it's, it's a lot harder for other people to change your records. In the case of the Twitter, Huffington Post, and New York Times, um, the attacker essentially convinced the, the registrar to change those records, to go to them. So there wasn't a very uh, fault-tolerant process there to prevent the social engineering from happening. 
Of course, you may want to look at outsourcing potentially DDoS and making sure that, hey, some, you know, if you do get DDoS, which is becoming more and more common, you know, what are you going to do? How do you know you're not going to go down? How critical is your website, your email, and your, your, your authoritative DNS to your business? You need to look at those things. And on the recursive side, you know, first and foremost, you got to figure out where you have kind of visibility issues. You know, we have a, a very seamless, simple way to deploy a, an agent down to your laptops. Um, and all the laptops and, and, and phones do is they encrypt all of the data and they come to our cloud. And this allows you to regain visibility, not just to DNS when you're inside the company, but also outside of the company. And you don't want a security or a suite of security solutions that effect, is effective, you know, 90%, you know, 90% effective of 50% of the time, meaning that you may have good efficacy when you're internal, but as soon as you leave the network, you've lost visibility and you lose the efficacy. So you need to investigate your corporate DNS recursion. You know, where does your DNS go? Does it go directly to your ISP? Does it go to a security solution? Do you have an internal server where you're logging all this data? Or does it ultimately just go to the authoritative um, you know, name servers? And are you really looking at this data in any meaningful way? So with that, we really think it's key to store and understand your DNS data. Of course, if you point your DNS to us, we do that for you. Otherwise, you need to have a way to look at what your clients are looking up. And of course, it's important internally and externally to have this capability. Because if you can't see what people are looking up, it's very hard to look back in time to see if you know, an end user was infected. Or if you have an indicator of a compromise that is DNS-based, and maybe it's not using HTTP or a known protocol, you, you may not log that. So you need to be able to look at that data. And you know, we're really, you know, we are a 100% cloud-based solution. Um, you know, we, we kind of live um, you know, and die by evaluations. And we highly recommend uh, you know, that, that you try the solution. Any security solution be, should be put through its paces um, to evaluate it. We have an incredibly easy, simple way to do that. It starts off with simply pointing your DNS to us. You don't have to turn on any policy. You can simply turn it on, and we will log and show you and identify things that are happening on your network. We could tell you potentially who's infected with botnets. We could tell you who's connecting to malware sites. We could tell you what laptops may be infected. We could tell you maybe where people are being infected inside versus outside. And we can do this in a very simple, meaningful way. And really, we are kind of a prove-it-to-me company. Um, we really uh, love when customers try our solution, and we let the dashboard and the data speak for itself. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you very much. If you, of course, any questions, feel free to email me. My email is very simple. It's just dan at opendns.com. And I encourage you to go to signup.opendns.com and uh, register for a, a very simple, easy-to-use 14-day trial and let the product uh, show itself. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a great day.